Uh, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, principal, God, so many distinguished people, I'm nervous before I start, so let's wrap it up now and have a beer. <laughs> um, I'm going to tell you about various things, mostly about T cells and asthma, but a few other things as well. As the principals mentioned, I thought it only right to go back to where research started for me, just briefly, so I hope you'll indulge me here. I was lucky enough to get into Hartford College, where I understand the principal's son went too, so there we go. Um, this was founded in one of the earliest Oxford colleges, um, founded in the 13th century, hasn't moved from its present spot in Cat Street. <coughs> it was made a full college in the 18th century. Its buildings fell into decay in the 18th century because of precarious finances. That's a recurring theme, isn't it, in university history, isn't it? Particularly in Hartford College, which is one of the most um, uh, least well-kept and least rich colleges of all the University of Oxford. But owing to the benevolence of Sir Thomas Baring and the architectural skills of Sir Thomas Jackson, it was built in its present form about that time. It's got the famous bridge. Everybody knows the bridge, but they never know what college it belongs to. And here's the octagonal dining hall and the college chapel where I used to sing an even song many an evening when I was an undergraduate. It's got some fairly famous alumni. Charles James Fox, the great politician of, at the time of um, the, man, the Mad King. Um, Evelyn Moore, who uh, was fairly undistinguished as an undergraduate, a sad man, went to work for one of the Tabloids was expelled from a public school where he was a teacher for drinking too much. Uh, John Dunn, who played a, a very great part in the Reformation, starting off a Catholic, but eventually becoming a Protestant, because that, in those days that was the only way you could get into Parliament and politics. William Tyndale, who produced the first English translation of the Bible. If you've not read Tyndale's translation, I do commend it to you. It's fantastic. Of course, eventually he was burned at the stake as a heretic for his pains in, uh, in Holland. At Oxford there's the Sir William Dunn School of Pathology, where a lot of famous people in the immunological field have worked. At the time I was there, uh, people like Simon Gordon, Simon Hunt, Gordon McPherson, there were some household names in immunology. And it was these people really who inspired me to uh, to love immunology, but above all, to love research. The undergraduate curriculum at that time at Oxford, you spent the first two years of your three pretty clinical years cramming stuff. And it was boring, but at least after that two years, you knew quite a lot of physiology, anatomy, biochemistry, and pharmacology and therapeutics. And then the third year was quite the reverse. Everybody sat back. You chose two or three specialist subjects, and you spent a lot of time just sitting with learned people, uh, mulling over immunological problems. And that, for me, it was, that was very formative for me. It, um, it, it engendered in me this germ of you know, desire, as it were, to, 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 to do science. Much more tempting now, than you know, much more exposure through that route than a lot of undergraduates get today. And uh, this is what really set it off for me. Henry Harris was the director of the Dunn School at that time, um, who's since retired. Obviously, Herman Waldman runs it now. But I learned a lot with some very learned people behind those walls. So much so that after I'd done my basic medical qualifications, I decided I needed a research job. And I picked up the BMJ, like you do, and the first one that came to light was one at the Brompton Hospital, the Cardiothoracic Institute, uh, in the Department of Asthma and Allergy there, Allergy and Clinical Immunology, actually, to be certain. And so I first went and saw the Brompton Hospital. This is what it looked like when it was built in about 1850. It was a hospital for TB, one of the many TB hospitals, uh, but uh, it became a centre of excellence, really, in, in the whole global sphere of respiratory medicine. The Cardiothoracic Institute, where I worked, was not exactly a gem of architecture. It was this little Nissen hut here, built in the sort of car park at the side of the hospital here. <clears throat> and in that window there, or thereabouts, Barry will correct me if I'm wrong, lived Professor Barry Kay, who I met on one morning when I came down to 
talk about this research post he had. The labs where we worked were just around the corner there. Uh, we had one lab shared about between about 15 people. Uh, I, don't know about, I don't know about health and safety in those days, but we, we shared about five people to one desk, and we had uh, one, one little computer that took ages to do everything. And, uh, but in those days, we didn't have so much to do. And that's where we discussed T cells and asthma. So these two fittish blokes here, the first one is Barry, he's sitting over there. Thank you, Barry. And I'll talk about this one a bit later. And that's when I first <laughs> remember his face, you may need it. I made a talk this my first <coughs> my first half of my career really was with Barry. Barry Kay. Now, during my time at uh, Brompton, they built us a brand new uh, Heart and Lung Institute, which is now known as the Guy Scadding Building after it, one of its most famous alumni, Glenis Scadding, is sitting with me in the audience today. This used to be an old nunnery that was built across a, a square courtyard, and at night you were supposed to be able to hear the nuns in their chains rattling around if you came home too late from your experiments. This was one of our group photos in those days. There's me. Ah, oh, even more handsome. There's Andy Wardlaw, who's now Professor of Respiratory Medicine at Leicester. And there's Redwood Mockbell, who's Professor of Science in Canada. This is uh, Piero Maestrelli, who's Head of uh, Occupational Medicine at the University of Padua. There's Robin O'Hare, Professor of Respiratory Medicine at Monash. There's Oliver Cromwell, who became Chief Scientific Executive of Allergo Pharma, the people who make uh, allergy vaccines. And uh, there's Jill, who's in the audience again today. So a lot of very famous people came out of Barry's land. There was a great academic environment. And here's uh, it, uh, me in one of my frenetic debates with Steve Holgate. Look at the jacket. I'm glad I got rid of that. <laughs> when I was much younger. And what did we talk about? Well, we talked about T cells in asthma. Why study asthma? Well, there are a lot of people with asthma. 12% of children, 6% of adults, nearly 6 million people. 600,000 people suffer from symptoms daily. So, you know, it's not a very important disease. It doesn't get the funding of cancer or the, it doesn't have the razzmatazz of heart attacks. It's just simply a disease that makes many, many thousands of people's lives miserable. Um, and it does kill people. Again, you know, again, we're all paranoid about dying of heart attacks. But asthma does kill one person every eight hours. So, you know, every day that goes by, three more people die. 18 million days were lost from work in 2007 because of asthma. It's estimated to, make, it's estimated to cost the NHS £800 million, which is a sizable proportion of its total budget, and let alone the total societal costs when you take into account the cost of the social security, the time these people have off work. It is a huge economic drain. If we were to just think if we were rid of £2 billion a year, you know, we talk about um, uh, writing our national debt and our tax bills. If we, if we just made us better, we'd be a lot better off. Most of the suffering is in the, the small percentage of asthmatics who have the worst disease. A group of us, some asthmatics don't get better when you give them the treatments we do have for reasons which we don't understand and for reasons which I'll, I've been researching into myself. The vast majority stay reasonably well, providing they take their treatment properly and they know how to take it. It's really this top half, this top few percent here that cause all the trouble, suffer the most, and account for most of the expense. What is asthma? Well, it's variable obstruction of the airways. The airways lined by smooth muscle in their, their top extent, and later not, and the, the airways become variably obstructed. They're open one moment and shut the next. They're also twitchy. Bronchial hyperresponsiveness is the second cardinal clinical feature of asthma. When you inhale something, it makes your airways constrict. All sorts of things that wouldn't make non-asthmatics airways constrict, like your girlfriend's perfume, strong smells, smoke, fog, cold air. All these things make your airways constrict. If you're asthmatic, they don't make them significantly constrict if you're not. And this is one of the cardinal problems with asthma. And this has always been associated with chronic inflammation in the airways. And the, in, the, the assumption has always been that these, these phenomena are somehow linked. And we'll, we'll talk about that a bit more later. If you look at the pathology of asthma, 
Of course, there is a, a very large inflammatory infiltrate. This is uh, these blue cells are T cells, the pink ones are eosinophils. You can see this, this whole mucosa is filled up with these cells. This should be an airspace here, but it's filled up with this gunky lump of mucus, which is another feature of asthma. Patients make too much mucus and it sticks in the airways. And all these eosinophils have come through the airways and are infiltrating this, this gunk. And so the eosinophil infiltration and T cell, mononucleosome infiltration, has always been a striking feature of asthma. And again, the assumption has been that the two are causally connected. And when I came into the asthma field in the late 1980s, about 1988, asthma was thought of almost completely, and I think it's true to say this, in terms of periodic spasm of the muscle. It was believed that this spasm was caused by release of acute uh, bronchospastic mediators, particularly histamine, to a lesser extent, leukotrienes, released from mast cells. Everybody thought that asthma was essentially allergic. Um, and what happened was, when you, when you inhaled something to which you were allergic, it cross-linked the IgE on your mast cell, the mast cells poured out histamine, and off you went. It caused acute bronchoconstriction, which flew in the face of many simple observations, not least the fact that you know, not all asthmatics are allergic. Only about 70%. You don't have to have allergy to have asthma. But these sort of uh, um, you know, small print points were glossed over. The word was that asthma was caused by allergy. And it's really only um, another big thing against that was that, you know, how long it took to get better when you gave people steroids. Inhaled steroids came out for asthma in the 1960s. They were a great invention. And they, they made people gradually and progressively better. And, if, and, and people were, were thinking, well, if asthma is caused by intermittent acute dumping of histamine into the airways by allergy, why do steroids make it progressively better? And so people start to think, well, no, it's not. Maybe it's not all um, acute bronchoconstriction caused by mast cells. <clears throat> and working at, uh, first at the, the Brompton with Barry and later here with, with TAC, we've been able to fill in a lot of the, the bottom half of this diagram, showing that indeed asthma is not just um, a, 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 a disease of acute problem constriction, it's a disease of chronic inflammation, where products of inflammatory cells, particularly T cells, cytokines, orchestrate this eosinophilic infiltration, and that somehow this, this, this damage is going to be We still don't know what the relationship is between this inflammation and the mucosa, as I'll discuss later, but we filled in a very substantial part. And this sort of reaction you see in the airways, no matter what sort of asthma you're dealing with, whether or not the asthmatic is, is allergic or not. And the first paper I published on this appeared in The Lancet, May the 21st, 1988. Um, me, Barry, and Adele Hartman, who was a great colleague of mine, who did all the flow psychometry. In those days, our flow cytometry worked off a sort of torch bulb that kept flickering, and when the, when the sensitivity went off, you had to bash it on the top to get the bulb back in position. You didn't have lasers. <laughs> uh, and um, so, you know, this was the very first incarnation of the flow cytometry, and I'm very fond of it. In fact, if I could afford it, I would have brought it and kept it at home with all my other junk and drove my wife mad. <coughs> But, you know, what, what we saw was that the T cells in asthmatics ex expressed markers of activation. This is interleukin-2 receptor, which we thought was a marker of activation. We now know it can be a marker of suppression, so we didn't know enough then. But other markers of activation, HLADR, type 2 histocompatibility antigens, and adhesion molecules, all were overexpressed in asthmatics. And then this correlated with disease severity, and it was markedly on CD4 cells, so-called helper cells, rather than CD8 cells. CD4 cells are the ones that help all sorts of different immunological reactions through their production of cytokines, whereas CD8 cells are primarily cytotoxic to virally infected cells. So this is what set off the bandwagon. 